Greetings, greetings and welcome. Thank you. Today we're going to be going into the labyrinth of my mind. <laughs> just joking really. Um, just some observations actually that I've made since I returned to my homeland, returned to Jamaica. Um, I was born here, grew up in England and then came back to Jamaica and I've been back now, I'm into my seventh year and obviously this has been a, an interesting time, a revealing time when you're questioning everything and looking at everything and because basically everything that we've been given, all of our education, everything is from a very Eurocentric socio political religious construct it's like a matrix that they've placed over us but what's interesting is that they are questioning the system and they're questioning the things that they've been taught and a lot of the articles that we're reading and a lot of the things that we're looking at yes it does come from this Eurocentric point of view but you have got a younger generation now that are actually questioning what they were taught so we always do have to bear in mind that when we're being given information even in today's environment where there is so much what we would call new information around and old which is new because we didn't even know of its existence before so it's new to us that there are still certain mindsets that we need to kind of consider that are held by Europeans. The out of Africa theory and that whole religious kind of um, aesthetic kind of uh, information that takes us back to this Greco Roman philosophy or takes us back to some kind of monkey man praying to. Uh, Baphomet goat god weirdness we've looked at pictures in these new old books new to us but they're old that were written by Jesuits who in my eyes are spies at the end of the day studied us to the point where now in 2020 what we're seeing is that they've actually codified natural behavior they've got to the point where they can sell or commercialize aspects of our story our spirit spirituality and sell it back to us at a profit they have us accepting what I call ridiculous concepts but as I said I've been back for six years I have to jump in a taxi to get to most of the places I need to get to and one of them is where I go and do my shopping strangely enough I've been one of the things I've been complaining about is the fact that we've had no water um, and I had to actually stop complaining because we didn't have any rain either and um, whilst I was still look at Jamaica Water Company and say we now have no water our guard in the middle of a pandemic epidemic thing but okay so we've not had any rain so it's been very dry very very dry but before I go into my revelation of what I found you know when you grow up in England you kind of grow up in very flat, very concreted areas. Um, I can think of Streatham Hill, Tulse Hill. There was that one up by uh, Wood Green that takes you up into like uh, past Hornsey. And where was the other one? I think I've mentioned it. I've mentioned. I was going to try and mention the four kind of corners, but I've forgotten the one over at North London. But anyway. You're not used to seeing hills until you go up 
into like say Wales or even Scotland you might actually start seeing some proper mountains up there but I've been back now for about six years and I've been watching what I thought was just a plot of land I've been watching it watching it the first time it caught my attention was because there was just like lines and rows of yam and I'm quite fascinated to see yam growing they kind of stand up it grows up the vine and um, you have to dig it down deep but the plant itself grows up the vine so when you see lots of yam they're like soldiers or standing to attention it's quite unusual to see it like that but anyway I started to pay attention because I do love to see food growing anyway yam takes a while to sort of come into season so I think he had that for a good sort of 18 months that he was growing that then after that he was growing cash crops like pak choy things like um, what I planted today actually pak choy, skellium, thyme, tomatoes that type of thing so that doesn't need much explaining cash crops they're going to come through quite quickly and then after that he had a cow and the last time after the cow he had papaw so this is over what is coming up to now a, a seven year period from the pictures that you probably notice I don't really see that there's anything planted there right now but that doesn't mean that um, the seeds if there are things planted that seeds won't be popping up at any any time soon so because of that when I was driving up there the other day um, I, I glanced over there because I thought I wonder what he's got growing up there at the moment let me have a little peek because I haven't seen anything up there for a while and obviously as I said no rain so it's very dry a lot of bushes that would normally be all fat and green just a little sad and wilted and not really showing of course when I looked over there it just there in front of me big old mound it's a mound I've been looking at this mound for six years and didn't realize it was a mound um, because f funnily enough I'm always looking on the opposite side of the road so when I'm coming home I'm not looking on that side I'm looking on the opposite side but I still didn't notice those mounds because it's usually so lush and so green but the other day when we passed that area and I thought but, but, uh, that's a mound I looked over to my left and I thought oh no look at this now two of them right in front of me right in front of me and as I was longing out my neck because the taxi drivers do drive kind of fast still to observe I thought to myself look at what I can look at what I'm looking at here I'm looking at some mound science that's what I decided to call it because when you actually look at it what you're looking at when the Sun is coming up depending on the geographic position of your mound it means that you can plant various different things from the bottom up to the top you can actually treat your mound like a cake so you can grow portions of your land where you have certain things growing cake slices or you can treat it like a wedding cake so it's tiered so you can have the top row you're growing this bottom row your row underneath you're growing something else etc etc till you get down to the bottom what that actually means is that you're growing a crop that allows you a lot of variety it will also allow you to have a lot more space so therefore you can actually grow a lot more crop and let's not forget you can actually live on top of it as well you can build your house on the top of that plus as well as I said if you think about it if you've got your terraces you've got some form of irrigation that will help you and um, apparently when I did some searching not that I needed validation because I'm looking at it and it just was just common sense 
um, it does actually help against flood damage as well and um, you get bigger crops a bit longer season and uh, what is it bigger crops longer season yeah so you're able to pick for longer and obviously because of your space you're able to um, feed more people so then I started thinking about cacao now I watched a very long show on cacao but I love chocolate I really do and I'm not talking necessarily about the dairy milks I do like I don't like dark, 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 dark chocolate, but I'm quite happy to go with a 70%, you know, if it's a good one. Um, and I know that that type of chocolate is very good for you as well. Um, in the lecture, what the gentleman was saying um, was that the Europeans couldn't really, didn't really get the whole way that the uh, Aborigines had planted their cacao. But when I saw this mound, it made total sense to me because what they're talking about is companionship planting. And if you actually look um, on some of those pictures, what you'll see is that they've, on one of the mounds, you'll see that they've left areas which is just totally wooded, just completely left it. So you're going to create some kind of an ecosystem there because you're going to have the birds, the bees, because you're not really doing anything with it. So all of the insects and the animals that you're going to need to fertilize and pollinate your crops that you're growing around the area are actually going to be actually on your land as well um, and we know that that was something that the Maya and the Aztecs did because they were planting papaw, avocado and other companionship plants that the soil and the cacao loved so basically you had this little ecosystem that was just made for the cacao and it worked um, clearly Europeans didn't really understand this um, because if they did surely they would have tried to implement or continue with it with a system similar to that because it works this and you can do it on flat land as well but this European way of doing everything where they just have this monoculture thinking where you just have swaths and swaths of land that's just growing one particular thing is actually really dangerous because you just need one disease or one problem and your whole crop is wiped out whereas the way that the Aztec and the Maya yeah I realise it's going to take a lot of forward planning but hey remember these people studied time and knew that time was cyclical so they had a lot of time to study their mounds and study food production and the best way to get food uh, get the best food the best production out of your land now let's take this one step further let's just use a bit of imagination here imagine you've got your mound you've got water around the bottom of your mound and you've got all manner of trees being pl planted at the bottom of your mound again you've created another type of ecosystem there because the moisture from the trees are going to help the food that's growing on your mound and I truly believe that this is what they found here I really do I, I think that um, when you go back and you listen or you read the books about what the Europeans said they found here I mean these people were talking about garden forests garden forests now we're always making jokes about the fact that oh hey we're, we're wild Indians <laughs> we're wild Indians you know would a wild Indian have a perfectly manicured garden? Would we? I don't think so. Would we have a wild forest full of crazy animals that just love the environment and crazy big fruit growing 
that you've just designed for a particular plant, cacao as an example, that you love and so you create garden forests that can cultivate your cacao which again would take a lot of planning because some of the trees some of the plants that the cacao love are are older trees they're not it's not just purple which is something that is going to grow in a, in say a few months so yeah sometimes i think that these things that are written in stone are it's simple it's a simple simple science but because the European way of thinking is kind of but what if as an example what's really missing off of the top of that dollar bill isn't no capstone it's your house your house my house because that pyramid represents your land and represents how you as the king of your land or the queen of your land of your man are able to feed not only your family but very many many people around you and let's not forget there's man's all up and down North America the ones that they've kept so maybe our ancestors were telling us things you know this force matrix that they're talking about that they've set up grid energy grid I'm not saying it doesn't exist but sometimes there's just a simplicity in the science that maybe they're they're trying to remind us because maybe they knew about cataclysms maybe they knew because they understood that time is cyclical and disasters happen and that they perhaps weren't going to be around to be able to explain it to us in ways that we would know it the way they did so they tried in their way to explain it to us and they wrote it in stone very simple uh, validation but I came home did a little bit of a google search and look at what I found go this is the blade and this is my mound of science after taking the pictures of my video I decided to just have a quick look to see if anybody else is thinking like this and here it goes gardening with the mound method Woodco farmer says Hugel Coulter is technique and this is by Tari Lane and it's from the blade Hugo Coulter is happening along a Wood County Road where it's embraced so enthusiastically by one small-scale farmer that he'll expand on its benefits at the drop of a sun hat. I can't say enough about mounds, says Don Schooner, owner of Schooner Farms. He's even built a one-third representation of Ohio's serpent mound, planting sweet Mara de Bois strawberries on its sloping sides and leeks on top four years into using this ancient Eastern European method <coughs> Don Schooner believes Hugel its English pronunciation is the ideal way to raise produce to its genetic potential plant a little sooner and harvest a little longer he says moreover he figures production is one and a half to two times better than in flat ground and there's less bending down. He calls Schooner Farms at the junction of US 6 and State RT 235 a production farm that has you pick strawberries, blackberries and red raspberries. Strawberries and blackberries are ripe now. A CSA garden community supported agriculture in its sixth year of growing produce for 40 families and an educational event location with classrooms and an outdoor courtyard for gatherings. 
Becky Schooner, his wife, is a herbalist who handles the farm's marketing and social media. In truth, these 20 acres of black sandy loam are both laboratory, the new tap-operated Flow Beehive, a planned seven-acre food forest with fruit and nut trees and perennial produce and the possibility of freshwater lobster and playground plant our commercial kitchen in which to make food and herbal products and construction of yurts for guests to stay in while learning about Hugo Coulter. And of course there will be more mounds, maybe in the shape of Celtic symbols or Morse code, I'm open. Full of ideas and boundless energy, he sleeps about four hours a night, plus a catnap or two. Schooner, 47, has moved, has moved to Mother Nature's rhythm since he was a child. Growing up a few miles from his farm, he hunted, been a beer tracker, a deer tracker, collected and sold praying mantis cases by the tens of thousands and worked in a garden centre. In 1989 he established a chapter of Wood Lucas County, Pheasants Forever, of which he is president. In 1996 he launched Inspired by Nature, an all-natural pond management business, and in 2002 he dug three half-acre ponds 19 feet at their deepest in which blue tilapia feed on algae. A new pay-to-fish operation will offer salmon and trout fish in spring and fall, and in warm weather yellow perch, sunfish, bass and bluegill. He's also testing the feasibility of freshwater shrimps as well as aquaponic vegetables growing in fish water. He's a disciple of Aldo Leopold, the late wildlife management visionary, and gives away copies of Leopold's A Sandy County Almanac by the case. He's a land ethnic, ethic leader and a certified permaculture designer. And there's lots of lavender, which Mrs. Gooner uses to make essentials. A labyrinth outlined with 750 lavender plants is a third of a mile in and out, it's centred by an obelisk. Smaller is better. Hugo Coulter, a word for German and a word of German origin, isn't for the big pr production grower, but for the small farmer or gardener. This is beautiful, Mr Schooner says. A dozen mounds are in production ranging from 25 to 250 feet long and about 6 feet wide. They're ex intensively planted with lettuce and broccoli, peppers and spinach, carrots and cabbages. Kooks and summer squash started from seed in early August are well on their way to providing a crop before frost. One 25 foot long mound is packed with 250 sweet potato plants. We have 35 categories of vegetables and we have not found one that doesn't like the mound. He says we watch, we see. You've got to read the landscape. If you don't read nature and you try to control it, good luck. A 20, 200, uh, wow. A 250 foot long strawberry bed on flat ground has 500 plants in black plastic sheeting. When those plants are spent, he'll put strawberries on mounds. If you were to build up a mound, you'd have 10 linear feet across the bed. I could put 2,500 strawberry plants on a 250 foot long mound, so production would increase dramatically because we have more square feet of space. More mounds are built north to south for maximum south exposure, but near the ponds he built several east-west mounds just to see how they do. One mound is like constructed so visitors can learn its anatomy. Its base is logs and stumps of select trees. He uses maple, cottonwood, oak and 
ash. Next are piles of partially decomposed leaves followed by fresh wood chips, then decomposed wood chips. On top of that, long branches serve as shoulder pads providing shape near the top. Then comes old straw or dried weeds, picked before they've gone to seed. Three or four inches of finished compost made on site or complement of a horse farm and the same amount of topsoil. We pack it tight as we can but still it's loose. When done it's about three feet tall and six feet wide. In its first year a mound will shrink requiring shoring up with compost and topsoil. Over time it decreases to 24 to 30 inches but serviceable for 10 to 12 years before the wood has become rich topsoil. The mound, the mound's logs and branches hold water, making for a moist, spongy interior. If there are parallel mounds, rainwater can be trapped between the two damming the ends of the paths with a board or pile of dirt. The wood banks the rainwater. Schooner has watered the mound six times this season tap and has fertilized once or twice on the fall crops. For the whole farm, I haven't used five gallons of organic fertilizer concentrate this year. A bonus, mounds are flood and drought resistant. In the last two years, we've had both. This year, this whole area was underwater and we lost nothing at all. Says Gunnar, who took aerial photos of standing water with his drone camera. The mounds absorbed the water and banked it. Next will be blueberries. I'll dig about 18 to 24 inches deep first and fill with acidic pine needles and pine and spruce logs and branches. Not everything we do works. I want to be able to fail to figure it out and learn. Alright, so Schooner Farm.